And lest you think that a song written, Rejoice in the Lord, was easy to live out in a life, you need to be aware of two things in Ron Hamilton's life, many blessed things, many wonderful things. But they lost a son through suicide, and Ron suffered from dementia in the closing portion of his life. And yet, what a blessing to read such words and to know that they were written by a man who lived them out. Rejoice in the Lord. It takes time to read those next five chapters in the book of Leviticus, beginning in chapter 11 and moving through chapter 15. But if you'll do that, if sometime today you will read those chapters, or sometime in the very near future, read those chapters, you'll be struck with the minuteness of the rules. Did you catch that as we read just the portion that we did? We didn't go into the portion that dealt with those things that move in the waters, and you may eat or may not eat. We didn't deal with the fowls and uh, what birds you could eat and what birds you couldn't eat. They're all included. But did you catch the minuteness of what God was exacting upon his people, Israel? And it had a purpose. It had a purpose to indicate to them that the Lord, the one who was giving them those instructions, was holy and what he expected from his people was holiness and these chapters deal with things that necessarily are arbitrary and ceremonial in the law that God had given to Israel through Moses and we know today that Christ has fulfilled the requirements of the Mosaic law including the fact that he became the sin offering, the burnt offering. He was the peace offering. He's the one who provided for us in every realm of life. He was dying in our place. He was our substitute. He went to the cross, not because of anything he did, but because he was bowed to the will of the Father and the only way for man to be cared for as to his sin was if a substitute died and Jesus Christ was that substitute. <coughs> he fulfilled the requirements of the Mosaic law. He did so by dying as he did a substitute. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, or chapter 2, excuse me, and verses 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Oh, the depth of what Paul is saying in those verses need, need to be plumbed. And we need to search out and, and get a good understanding of what God is saying at that point through the Apostle Paul. Philip P. Bliss wrote of it in a song that I'm sure is familiar to you, a marvelous hymn. And it begins this way, free from the law, oh, happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all. Once for all, oh sinner, receive it. Once for all, oh friend, now believe it. Cling to the cross, 
the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. The next stanza says, now we are free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh, hear his sweet call. Come, and he saves us once for all. Children of God, oh, glorious calling. Surely his grace will keep us from falling. Passing from death to life at his call. Blessed salvation once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O friend, now believe it. Cling to the cross. The burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. He captured in that hymn exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. And it is a reflection of what we see there in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. The law was arbitrary. Arbitrary. What do I mean by that? Well, it was for a destined time. It was for a particular period of time for a particular purpose. And when it accomplished that which it was commanded, the law became absolute, uh, obsolete. Obsolete. Are you and I under the obligations of the law today? Do we take time to read those chapters in the book of Leviticus, verses or chapters 11 through 15, to say, I, I need to know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm allowed to eat and what I'm not allowed? We don't come to this passage with that thought in mind. The law was not given to us, but to Israel, but it served a purpose until it had completed what it accomplished in the hearts of people and what God had commanded. It had a ceremonial purpose, but it was temporary. It was something that God gave with purpose to those people. And we can see that, we can understand that if we turn to the book of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. You remember the account in Acts chapter 10 of uh, a man by the name of Peter. We're very familiar with Peter in the New Testament scriptures. And uh, he was in Joppa, uh, not all that far, but some distance from Caesarea. Caesarea, there was a man by the name of Cornelius who had received from the Lord instruction that he was to, to send to Joppa for one, Simon Peter, and that he would then be able to give him words that would speak of eternal life. When we encounter Peter, he's on a rooftop and he's uh, getting hungry. It's noon. And as they are preparing something for him to eat, he falls into a trance. And he sees certain things in connection with that, a vision of a great sheet let down, filled with all manner of creatures, all manner of beasts, all manner of fowls, all manner of creeping things. And God has some instructions for him. So Cornelius sends to Joppa to bring Peter to himself. And that's what we read of in Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trench and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air, and there came to him a voice, a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is 
common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Here is Peter seeing this great sheet that is lowered to him. And he looks within it, and here are all these creatures that it is forbidden for a Jew to eat. They are unclean. And God speaks to him and says, Peter, rise, kill and eat. No, no, Lord, I've never done that. I've not done that in connection with anything that is uncommon, uh, that is common or unclean. He's harking back to what we have here in the book of Leviticus. And those things that were indicated to Israel, these are unclean for you to eat. God has a purpose ceremonially that he wants them to to understand. And these next five cha chapters deal with matters of ceremonial cleanness and uncleanness. And it's not my intention this morning to try to take us verse by verse through all of these chapters, but I want you to, to allow God's Word to captivate you with what is involved and see the importance of it from God's viewpoint and not simply from our own. For the Jews, there were acts that were not morally wrong. We need to understand that. There were acts that they could be involved in that were not morally wrong. But nevertheless, even though they were not morally wrong, God indicated to them that they were barred from participating in the rituals of Judaism if they did get involved in those acts that were not morally wrong, but God had indicated they are unclean. They have a purpose, and I want you to be a holy people. And those who became defiled were ritually unfit until they were cleansed. So we, we see all the things that God requires concerning offerings, sacrifices that are to be brought, and now God is telling Israel there are certain things that are out of bounds for you, not morally, but they are out of bounds for you because I have determined that you should know the difference between holy and unholy, and clean and unclean. And God is telling Israel, a holy people, a people set apart to God, a people that are to be in obedience to him and to reflect him before the world around them, a holy people set apart, consecrated to God, must be holy in every area of life. How often people determine that, well, on Sunday I have to be a certain thing. For Israel, it would have been in connection with worship, well, on the Sabbath I have to be a certain thing and I have to respond in a certain way, but I have no obligations beyond that. And God is saying, no, you're a holy people. You are set apart to me. You are mine. You are to be holy in every aspect of your life. Everything you do, everything you think, everything you say, it is to speak of the holiness of God. And God here in chapter 11 of the book of Leviticus uses even food to illustrate the difference between what was clean and unclean. God says, I'll give you an object lesson. I'll allow you to see what I expect from a holy people. Now, we have to establish in our minds, what was God's purpose? What was God's purpose 
why does he give all of these regulations in these five chapters? Chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. What is God's purpose? Why does he do this? And when, and, and within it, we have to ask ourselves the question, are there continued any germs of truth for us? Is it really five chapters that we can just pass over and say, oh, that was Israel, that was the Jews, and, and, and God had certain things he wanted them to know, but it doesn't have anything to do with me. Or are there germs of truth here that God says, you, child of God, in this age of grace, in this church age, there are things for you to understand about my holiness and what I expect of you in holiness. All the writings of Moses start at Genesis, work your way through to Deuteronomy, all the writings of Moses, in them we see, we see a divine hand which guides the pen. Moses didn't write what he did simply because this sounds like a good story. I think people will like this. They'll really be interested in knowing about us being brought out of Egypt. They'll be certainly interested in knowing how the world was created. They're going to read these things. No, no, no. God's divine hand was guiding the pen, if you will, of Moses. So that what he wrote was specifically what God wanted, but it also contains these truths that we need to understand and that had great impact upon Israel, but now also has important things to say to us. And yet, we understand that the law for us is obsolete. All through these writings, Moses has been showing God's hand is upon me. The brain the brain which planned the institutions, that framed the laws, that uttered the words, all of that was God guided. The word was given. All scripture, Paul says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable. And so Paul, or rather Moses, writes and God clearly tells us these are important things to understand. This is the basis for your understanding of what I give in the New Testament scriptures. And we look in these next few chapters dealing with the problem of defilement. What does it mean to be defiled as a child of God? It involves categorical distinctions between clean and unclean. You would think we would know that intuitively, but dear friends, we don't. In major areas of life, God speaks now in the book of Leviticus through Moses, and, and these are the things he deals with. Talking about cleanness and uncleanness, holy and unholy. He takes us in this direction because of what he says in chapter 10 of Leviticus and verse 10. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean or, and, and clean. That ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. Is that clear enough? Do we understand holy is different from unholy? That clean is different from unclean? God is driving that simple truth home to our hearts. And in these chapters, here's what he deals with. He uses food as an illustration in chapter 11. 
In chapter 12, he deals with childbirth and the laws of motherhood. Interesting chapter to read through. Consider carefully what God had indicated. In chapters 13 and 14, he deals with diseases and fungus. I don't think you can get much more nitty-gritty than that. But that's what he talks about. And then in chapter 15, he talks about bodily discharges. And in all of these things, God is noting for us and causing the priests to notice and the people to notice that there is a difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. And so the entire section, chapters 11 through 15, seems to be an insertion specifying here are the impurities that pollute the sanctuary. That's what God is concerned with. His sanctuary. The place where he dwells among the people and his, his uh, presence is evidenced by the cloud and the pillar of fire. And they know that God is among them. But now God says, here are the impurities that would pollute my sanctuary and would cause you to be defiled so that you are not able to come into my presence because of that defilement. And what the writer, Moses, is doing is leading us through these five chapters up to the purging rites of the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, there was much that was involved in the purging of the people, of the sins that had consumed them, perhaps, in the days before. And this whole section is introduced by those instructions for the priests. If you look again at Leviticus 10 and verses 10 and 11, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. It's not only that this difference between holy and unholy and clean and unclean has to be noted by the priests, but they are to teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So suddenly, all these things become very important. There are lessons they need to learn. It is to be illustrated in that way. And they were instructed to distinguish between clean and unclean. God says, you need to know the difference. You need to understand it, and it's very critical that you do. Distinguishing between holy and unholy. And what Leviticus chapters 11 through 15 do is lay down the principles for doing that. God says, here are the principles by which you are to conduct yourselves. And in doing that, you will be holy rather than unholy. You will be clean rather than unclean. And ceremonially, in the ritual of bringing the sacrifices and so on, you will be able to enter into the presence of the Lord. Now, it's critical to understand. It's critical for us to know if this, these principles are laid down and we are to use them to distinguish between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, then it's critical to understand the concept of clean and unclean, of holy and unholy, before we expound these chapters. Under the law, everything was classified according to the categories of holy 
or unholy. You could look at whatever it was you were doing or intending to do. You could consider carefully what God had already written and the instructions that had been given. And, oh, again, think of the minuteness. Think of having to, to, to be obligated. I've got to, I've got to meet this and this and this and this in order to ceremonially come into the presence of the Lord and pass through the rituals of sacrifice and have it accepted by him. I have to do all those things. Think about that. With only the holy, only what God said, yes, that's set apart to me. Yes, that is holy. Yes, that is free from sin. Yes, that is as it should be. Only that was permitted in the presence of God. Only that. And what was unholy, or as the Bible says also, common. Remember Peter said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. What was unholy or common included two sub categories, clean and unclean. So God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm holy. I am totally set apart from evil. I am totally set apart from sin. You are a holy people, and you are to be holy, for I am holy. Thus, meaning that you are to be clean in all that you do and not unclean. And the prohibition for Israel was a ceremonial prohibition. And its purpose was the insistence upon a, uh, the, the insistence upon and the constant repetition of this fact that God set before them a standard of holiness. Lord, how are we to know what you require? I'll give you my standard. These five chapters speak of standards that were to, to, to be followed in the lives of the children of Israel. Was it detailed? Oh, absolutely. Did they have to follow it in minuteness? Yes, they did. It was required of them. It was what God expected. He was teaching them and instructing them. And this prohibition was something that they needed in order to understand the standard of God's holiness, which their daily lives were to subscribe to. Their daily life was guided by all that God had written. <laughs> Read those opening books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch. Read those five books and watch for all of the detail that God gives. This is required. This is required. This is required. This is required. And then remember what we're told in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. God's glory is the standard in all things. Israel was serving not only as learning themselves what they were to do, how they were to approach God, and follow his standard of holiness, which their daily lives were to subscribe to, but they were being used of God as illustrations for what God anticipates and expects from us today as people of God. Under the law? No. Following the guidelines, the principles of chapters 11 through 15? No. But God says there's something here for you to know and to learn. Israel, Israel was a nation that was set apart to God. God said, you're mine. I've placed my love upon you. 
And I didn't choose you because you're the greatest people on earth. I didn't choose you because you're so special. I chose you because of my love. I put my love upon you. You are set apart to me, but you have a purpose. In being set apart to me, Israel, I want you to understand you are to teach the holiness of God to the heathen nations round about you. You are to have an impact and an influence upon the nations that exist around you. They need to see me, God, in you. They need to see the God of heaven, the God of glory. They need to see the one true living God. And you are to be holy and to teach holiness. And that separation was to reach to even their eating and drinking, their clothing and their housing. It was to reach everything in their life. Is there to be any difference with the Christian today as required by God? I don't, I don't mean following all of these details and thus, no, I can't eat that. It's unclean. It's common. I'm like Peter. Following all the details of separation that must come because of motherhood, childhood, childbirth. No. God is saying, I want you to understand and I want you to comprehend it through everything that you do that there is a difference between the one who professes to be the child of God and the one who is a part of this heathen world. And yet, though God has made that very clear, how often we forget it and we don't act in accordance. Look with me, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all what? iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works in essence God is telling us I want you to be clean and not unclean I want you to be holy and not unholy and through Christ through Christ he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself this peculiar people zealous of good works second corinthians chapter six here are the words of paul again to the believers at corinth beginning in verse 14 he 14 he says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness notice again the contrast and what communion hath Christ with Belial that was an appellative for Satan or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of God of the living God as God hath said I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye, here's the word, separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And then that, that great all-encompassing statement, when Paul says again to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink 
For whatsoever ye do, do it all to the glory of God. Now think with me about the Israelite. The Israelite. The individual Israelite in the day of Moses. Do you realize that he could not spend a day? He could not prepare a meal? He could not take a walk? He could not be entertained by friends? He couldn't engage in hunting? He couldn't do business with friend or foe without being reminded that he was under a covenant of blood to abstain from all appearance of evil. Hmm, this sounds like a familiar phrase, doesn't it? Could it be that there's one like that in the New Testament scriptures? That we are to abstain from all appearance of evil. But that was true for the Israelite. It didn't matter what they did. It didn't matter where they went. It didn't matter who they were with. They were to be holy, separated unto God. And the standard was God's glory, his glory. They were to show everyone around them the difference in God's sight between clean and unclean. Think about it for a moment. Clean and unclean. It's like the difference between a hog and a sheep that is pointed out by their actions when they fall into the mud. What happens when a hog falls into the mud? Oh, this feels so good. I think I'll just turn over to the other side and bask a little bit more. I love the feel of mud. It is my delight to be in the mud. The hog wallows in the mud. It is a, it, it is if, if he feels joy, it is a joy to him. He doesn't want to come out of it. He loves the mud. What about the sheep? The sheep falls into the mud. It doesn't roll from side to side and say, oh, I delight in this. This is so refreshing. The sheep bleats piteously. Please help me. Get me out of the mud. I don't like the mud. I don't want to be a part of it. And it's here that we see the difference between the child of God and the one who is not in Christ. What happens when they fall into the mud? And there's lots of mud around us. There are lots of opportunities to wallow in the mud. The sinner loves his sin. The sinner clings to his sin. The sinner even delights in his sin. The child of God hates his sin, and he cries like that bleating sheep to his heavenly father. Please, dear father, get me out of this mess in which I find myself. Please lift me out of the mud and cleanse me from all of its stains. I don't want it to be a part of my life. God said, you priests are to note the difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean, and you are to teach the people what it means to be holy. How do we, how do we understand what it is that God wants? How do we understand what it is that he is requiring of us? What does it mean then to be holy? What is our standard? May I suggest to you that there are two things we need to keep in mind. 
God has given, first of all, himself as the standard. Be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm so glad he didn't say, be ye holy as I am holy, because apart from being in the presence of the Lord, out of this life, and in a perfect body, that is an impossibility. Oh, positionally, it's true. But I am still dealing with the sins of the flesh in this life. And I suspect that you are as well. But we are looking to one who says, I'm the standard. Look at me. Know me. Know the Lord. But then I have to ask this question. How do I get to know the Lord in that measure so that I understand what it is that he requires and what it is that is holy and unholy, clean and unclean, it is only through the word of God. God's word points me to the God of the word. And God's word tells me, this is the God whom you serve. And these are his expectations. And it's not now Leviticus 11 through 15, following all the minuteness of details. It is looking to our God in heaven, getting to know him on a personal basis so that I understand what pleases him, what does not please him, what glorifies him, what does not glorify him. I learn all those things, but I learn it through the word of God because it's the word that he uses to teach us of himself. It is his revelation, his revealing of himself. Oh, friends, the holiness of God, the glory of God, the magnificence of our God. What a joy to know him. But I can't know him apart from his word. It must be a part of my life pointing me to him so that I see my God, the polar star, the one to whom I look for guidance, for direction, for teaching, for instruction. Oh, may that be the goal of our hearts this morning and in the days to come. Jonathan, if you would, please.